It's a good point for Heather James to walk in the room because Heather works for Conflict Heritage, who is the company I work for on a zero hour contract basis. Um, and so, just to kind of put out there, if you are going freelance and you work for other companies, whatever those companies are, it's important to know um, what would be a conflict of interest. Um, so, for example, if someone comes to me at a Conflict Heritage event and says, Oh, would you be interested in doing this? That's very, very much a North Light Heritage job um, that I would then ask if I could do that through North Light Heritage. You wouldn't take that and do that as a freelance person. Um, so that's just something, again, to be aware of. Um, I think you say the example you have is that you're working as a local authority archaeologist, so you don't work within the national park. Um, so things like that, just important to be aware of if you're going to be juggling lots of different types of jobs. Um, so part two is a little bit less heavy on numbers, uh, you'll be pleased to hear. Uh, it's a little bit more about the kind of overarching concepts and the details of like what actually happens once you're running your business. Um, the first thing really, treat your work like it is a business. It might seem that it's just you and you're working from your room at home, um, but it is important to have a kind of like an image and a style and a professional appearance to your business. It's quite important to have a recognisable style, whether that's just a sort of a message that you want to get out there or a concept. Um, all the way through to like a colour scheme, a logo, um, something that sort of defines you and what it is you're doing. And we'll go into that in a bit more detail as well in later in part two. Um, really, really important, as I've said, things like record keeping, so essential in terms of understanding what it is you're doing. Um, it's really important to have a structure um, of how you're going to work. Um, all the way through from your overarching business concept, your theme, your message that you want to get out there down to the nitty gritty of the health and safety forms, the templates, the pro forma, everything you want to fill out. Um, and what I would do initially, whether it's on a back of a postcard or in a really formal document or somewhere in between, is write down your business strategy. What are your aims, your objectives? What are you hoping to do? And um, where do you see yourself five years from now? I hate it when people ask me that question because I never know. But actually having to think about where you'd like to be, even if it's just kind of like wild dream sort of concepts, then having that information there, you can then come back to that and see in a couple of years how much progress you've made towards that. Have you moved in a different direction? Do you then need to adjust your business strategy to account for that? Um, and it's important to stick to your systems as well. Once you've got them in place, see how they're working, stick to them and then adapt them as you need to as you go through when new situations occur. So it's probably realistic for most people that if you're going to go freelance on a part-time basis or a full-time basis, you probably need to be prepared to spend a wee bit of money on startup costs. Um, you have to have the basics in place for whatever type of work you do, which as I said could be something as minor as stationary, a place to work, all the way through to large expensive pieces of equipment, depending on what type of work you're looking at doing. Um, I'm assuming a lot of people would be probably looking at going into some sort of community-based thing, considering most of your community trainees. Um, so you might find that the sorts of things you're spending money on aren't necessarily equipment, um, if people are bringing their own, or you might actually want to have a, field, a fund of equipment for community people to use. Um, it might be more um, the kind of advertising stuff that you want to spend your money on to begin with, depending on what sort of work you're wanting to do. Um, once you've got confident, confidence in the fact you're making a profit, then you can add to the resources as well and build up as you go along. Um, insurance is probably the biggest startup cost for people. Um, if you're going to be working in any environment, it's really important to have insurance to cover yourself, to cover other people. Um, and it does depend what sort of work you're going to undertake, what sort of insurance you're going to need. This is quite a simplified sort of list of things that I'm about to go through, but it's the basic stuff you need for quite a few different types of work. Um, the people I'd recommend are Towergate Insurance. Um, they have a specific archaeology and heritage division. They're recommended by the IFA. And the guy that you speak to on the phone actually understands phrases like watching brief total station, all the jargon. You get a real sense of confidence that you're being insured correctly for what it is you want to do. And he goes through in a huge amount of detail what sort of work you're going to do, what percentage of the year coming up do you think you're going to be on a watching brief or on community work, how many individuals are you going to have at your community projects. A lot of this information obviously you might not know, but you can give estimates um, to him and then you can always go back and refine that later if that changes or if it increases or decreases for some reason. Um, basically, once you've given him all the information, he comes back with a quote and you can then take or leave or take parts of it depending on what it is you ask for a quote for. So the main sorts of things to be aware of, professional indemnity. Um, this is particularly relevant if you're giving advice to clients. 
If advice you've given re um, re results in some sort of loss of income um, or a sort of hold up in a project, something that they aren't happy with, then they can basically sue. So professional indemnity is something that will protect you against that or pay for any legal costs um, involved in that sort of lawsuit. Um, that's probably particularly relevant if you're doing things in, a, in the commercial world in terms of watching briefs, um, but it's probably worth just knowing about as well in case you, you're not just doing community work, but you're branching out into other sorts of work as well. The main one I'd say that you need to have a think about is public liability. And this is so that if you're doing any work, if any member of the public, whether it's a volunteer on a project or just a passerby, is injured or has a loss as a result of work you're doing, uh, if they were then to choose to sue, then public liability is something that helps cover that. Um, and that's really, really important for community work because it's not just members of the public passing by, but the actual people you have with you um, that are being covered by that. Equipment cover, if you've got a lot of equipment, it's worth insuring it in case it gets stolen. And there is other cover available for quite specific things, things like exhibitions, if you're going to have a lot of expensive artefacts in your lab, things like that, they can all be specifically insured. Um, specific events, so if you are going to be doing, for example, five workshops in a year, you can get insurance for specific events rather than through the year. And things like property damage, again, maybe more relevant if you're going to be sort of going around with a JCB um, in tow. But even if it's minor property damage, then that would cover you for that. Um, and all these things are things that the Tarragate Insurance are willing to discuss. They can explain to you what they are and they can give you sort of information, um, lots more information than you probably want. Uh, my insurance document is about sort of 70 pages long with everything detailed. So you can ask for that sort of information in advance before you commit to a quote as well. Um, health and safety is essential. Um, it doesn't matter if you're going to be doing indoor workshops, outdoor work, um, commercial stuff, community stuff. It's really important to have health and safety policy. Um, there are IFA templates you can use and adapt for your business. And it's really important that that's written up right from the beginning. And then you know what your policies are. And even if you don't know much about health and safety now, by going through the template and by discussing it with people from the IFA, you can learn a lot more about what it is you need to be thinking about and trying to cover yourself for. Have a risk assessment template, and then just fill that out for every project, every bit of work you do in advance, and file it. Um, and it's important as well to make sure these get updated as the situation changes. So if you're out on site and a new hazard arises, make sure that gets reflected in your risk assessment. Um, if you're working in communities as well, or with other uh, staff or other people on site, important to communicate that information, make sure there are assessments with you, and make sure you give a briefing as well that summarises the points. Because the majority of people on community projects I've gone to don't really read it, so you want to try and just summarise it so they've got that information fresh in their heads um, before you go ahead on the project. Um, Organising work is really important, it goes hand in hand with your record keeping. Um, having a diary is the important thing. I have a work diary. For a long time it was just lots of this paper, but I've got a real one now with a hardback. Um, and it's just important to have that to put all of the information in, whether it's how far you've travelled, what projects you're doing. It organises your time, means you're less likely to overcommit. If you get lots of offers of work, you're not going to double book. And it really makes you structure your thought process. How much prep time do you need for a workshop? And do you have that built in already? Um, how much um, development time or time afterwards, or pro after a project for writing up, are you going to need? Uh, the more that that's written down in a diary format, the more likely you are to start to think, okay, this month's getting quite busy, I'm going to need to try and keep a bit of time for you the following month to do these things that won't get done that month. It's just all part of time management and new project management. Um, in terms of actually getting work, so you can fill your diary up, um, local contractors lists are quite good if you're um, interested in doing field work, things like that. Uh, if you go to the local authority, they often have a list of contractors that are either recommended, approved, or just um, a list and people can then choose who they contact. So this might be more relevant for commercial archaeology where um, clients who don't know archaeologists and aren't regularly working with archaeologists need to go and have some sort of reference point. Um, there's similar lists, things like um, Badger, the British Archaeological Resources, um, Jobs Resources page, um, CBA, IFA, all these sorts of organisations are the sorts of places to go to to investigate how you can advertise yourself to other archaeologists 
and other potential clients out with their archaeological and heritage kind of world. Um, going to conferences as well is really a good way of starting to mix with people, network, and get your name out there. And this sort of goes hand in hand with your marketing strategy, which we'll come on to a little bit more in, in there too. When you're tendering for work, if uh, a job has been advertised um, or they've, someone's come to you and requested a quote, um, you're going to be tendering for that work. It's important to take the time to think about how you're going to be competitive. Um, and that's not just how much are you going to cost, but what product are you going to give them that's different from someone else. And thinking through the project from start to finish, all of the possible things that could go wrong with it, try and think as negatively as possible in some ways, because then you'll have anticipated something that could go wrong, it might cost a bit more or might take a bit longer. What are the likely delays? Um, and that way you can then cost something quite accurately, rather than just thinking, oh, it's probably a couple hundred pounds, and then you find yourself, after weeks and weeks of development work, not having really been paid very well for the job. Um, if you're not successful when tendering for work, you can ask for feedback. You don't always get it, but it can be very helpful, um, just to understand why you didn't get a job. Because I think if you have, I've been in a situation where I've tendered for a couple of projects at a certain time, and then be unsuccessful in all of them, you start to think, what am I doing wrong? Am I too expensive? Should I lower my dairy? And you have all these sorts of thick thoughts about how, how can I improve and be more competitive? But if you actually get some feedback from the client as to why they didn't go for you, then that can really help, uh, both with confidence in terms of you know you're doing the right thing, or knowing where to change things and adapt things where necessary. So how much should you charge? Um, this is really a very sort of like open-ended question, I would say. I think there's a real sort of like need for a sliding scale of how much you're going to charge. It depends what you're doing, what you're providing, what's expected of you, and your experience level as well. And it's important that you have a good sort of like costing for a job with a bit of a buffer for unexpected circumstances. And it's important that that information is quite explicit so that the client knows um, this is how much it could cost at a maximum, but if it costs a bit less, that's what you'll be charged for. Um, you can charge either the day rate, hourly rate, weekly rate, depends what the job is again and what's, what seems relevant. Um, in addition to that rate, you have to charge for expenses, uh, for any costs that are going to be incurred above just your time. Um, so that can be travel, it can be accommodation, um, consumables, and any particular bits of equipment that are going to be necessary. And again, it's important to kind of itemise those things when you're giving someone a quote or a costing for a project. And that way the client knows what they're getting and what to expect. So that's yeah, that's the point I made there. Um, what I would say is again just keep things as clear as possible and keep records of where this information is um, has come from as well. If you've got a quote that has asked you to do something, you need a new bit of equipment for it, go away and actually find out how much that equipment costs plus that plus delivery, anything that could be associated with that, and keep that information so you know where to go with, you do get successful um, and have to go and buy that bit of equipment for that price. Um, and yeah, keep, keep records of everything. And when you're figuring out a day rate, it's quite important to have a think about not just how many days are you going to be physically working on the project in terms of field work or in terms of um, sort of contact time with community groups, but how much time are you going to be putting into prep, how much time development, how much time have you already spent uh, which isn't something you can normally explicitly charge for, but it's something to think about in terms of how much your day rate is. And then also thinking on to the future, you're not necessarily in a pension scheme, so you need to have a think about what is relevant in terms of being able to contribute to your own pension scheme, and what you need to run the business. So those are your overheads, in addition to actually just the time that's spent. And that's how you can start to have a think about um, your day rate and how much it actually is. Building and contingency is essential. Um, the bigger the project, the more essential the contingency is. The more complexities, the more uh, chance of things being delayed or things having to move to a different location or even just straightforward workshop. You want to go into one venue, but it turns out that's not available and then your venue costs double what you thought it would. Contingency is really important. So just, again, try and think about what can go wrong and make clear that when you're costing that that is a contingency fund and the client won't necessarily be charged unless something is um, making it more expensive. Um, you don't have to charge the client if it's not used, and it's much easier to say this is contingency money than to have to come back and say, well, I said it would be 600 quid, 
but it's a thousand now. And that's when the client comes back and says, that's unacceptable, that's not what I was quoted for. So this is where contingency becomes really important, just in keeping that communication clear. Um, as I said, you spend a lot of unpaid time doing things like setting up work. If you want to develop your own projects, um, if you're going to be applying to funding bodies like HLF or local funding, um, a lot of that work goes unpaid. So that's, again, something to have to think about in terms of what your day rate is going to be. Um, actual numbers for day rates, it completely varies. Um, and there's no right answer necessarily. So it's something you're going to have to make a decision on, um, depending on what work you're doing and what service you're providing. Um, standard field work, roughly something like 130 to 150 a day. Uh, skilled work, if you're doing something specific, specialist skills, whether it's uh, geophysics or um, sort of other survey work or illustration work, you might be getting a bit higher. And again, if it's something that you're the only person in the country that does it, then again, that should be taken into account in your day rate to some extent. Um, in terms of my knowledge working for people, this is sort of like a rough range of things that I've had to pay in terms of employing people. Um, I'm not giving out exact figures, obviously, just for confidentiality. So it's important to be competitive, but you don't want to undercut, and that's a very fine balance to get. It's um, something that you take into account as a self-employed person, probably not having to pay that. You're probably going to be quite competitive, um, just at your normal sort of rate. What you need to think about is what value are they getting from you? What skills am I taking to this project that other people might not be? And again, making it that clear that that's what people are paying for. Uh, larger companies often have higher rates, but they'll have much more resources to call on. If, for example, you get a job that's moved back by a week, you, are you going to be able to fulfill that contract? Possibly not if you've already got work set up for the following week. Larger companies don't necessarily have that problem. They've got more people to call on and more resources if things do start going wrong. So clients will probably be aware of that, but it's important just to make sure all that sort of information is kind of discussed beforehand. And it's really, really important to not deliberately undercut. If you know someone else is going for a job and you know how much they're charging, don't go under the amount just because you know what they're charging and it can be cheaper. That's just very unethical. And not, I don't really know many people doing it, but it's just important to sort of highlight it really because it's important that people value the profession and value the skills that we're taking. So charge what you think the job is worth. Um, and that's a sort of a good sort of mantra to keep when you're thinking about how much uh, to charge. Things that you can charge in addition to your daily, day rate, um, basically anything above your time. Uh, accommodation, materials, equipment, public transport. For things like public transport, it's worth just getting the, the amount um, off of ScotRail or off of the bus service or um, National Rail. And then you can always charge the cost of the ticket if it's cheaper than the overall amount. Uh, mileage, 45p a mile is quite standard for most vehicles. And subsistence, anything from 10 to 15 pounds a day, depending on where you're actually going to be working. If you're working somewhere with self-catering, that could maybe be a bit cheaper, but if you're working somewhere where you're going to have to be out every night, um, then you need to sort of take that into account in what you charge the client. And again, just actually getting quotes so that this is accurate prices that you're quoting, and also making it really clear in the, the project brief to the client that that's what this money is going towards. Um, then they can kind of assess that and take, make their own conclusions about whether you're value for money. Um, in terms of tendering as well, I should say clients, dep it depends on their system, but they may have to um, put it out to an open interview situation or invite an open tender so anyone can see the information being advertised and apply for the work. Um, you may get something that's called a kind of closed tender where um, three or four people are asked, and again, that might depend on company policy, how many people are asked to quote for a job. Um, and if some companies, they have a threshold where if it's below that amount, they can just contact individuals that they would like to do the work. So a particular specialist, and they might contact and say, could you do this job, how much would it cost? So it, it can be totally variable how much competition there is out there for the work you're applying for. Um, and again, that can maybe influence what sort of information you're putting in your document in terms of quoting for stuff. So the IFA website's a really good resource for getting further guidance on what's recommended for salary levels. They have a minimum expected salary and then a description of what you should be able to do for that salary. 
Um, and it's also important to make sure your day rate does increase as the years go on for inflation and also because your experience is getting bigger as you go. Um, so in terms of day rates, I have a sliding scale depending on what work I'm doing. Um, I charge different amounts and I have a special community rate where I can afford it because communities maybe don't have as much money to put towards these projects as a big client like um, sort of the government or sort of some big uh, commercial company. Um, in terms of employing staff or subcontracting, there's two different um, sorts of things you can do if you're in a project where you need more than one individual on the site. Um, employing staff is quite a big undertaking, probably not something to go into initially. I don't employ anyone myself, I would subcontract to someone else who's also freelance. Um, if it's a long term project though, it's probably something that's worth looking into. Um, just in terms of the ethics of the situation, if you're going to be employing someone for any length of time, it's good to do it. Um, in a sort of a way where you're providing them with pension. But that does involve a commitment from you to become an employer, um, which has a legal implication and a couple of other things that you have to do on the HNRC website as well. Um, you need to get associated insurance if you become an employer and you need to um, manage their KYE work um, because you'll be taking the tax and the national insurance off their paycheck before they get it. What's maybe more likely is if you're subcontracting because you need someone else on site for a couple of days or someone else for an event, then you need to set out a statement of work um, which has information on the work you're requiring them to do, um, the product you're hoping to get from it, whether it's just their time on site or whether you're wanting them to produce illustrations, uh, what the detail of that is, information on their pay, information on their conditions at work, and any timetabling information so that they know they have to keep that certain block of time free or it's a very flexible contract, in which case they can do five days of work within a month period, and also any deadlines, so that they also have that information in terms of when stuff needs done by. Um, they would then invoice you at the end of the project, or partway through the project, depending on what you prefer, um, and you can then pay them. So if you're subcontracting someone for something that will go over months and months, you might want to have a to chat with them about whether they invoice every couple of months for parts of the project, or whether they invoice right at the end and that's a discussion you would have with the individual. In terms of the company image, coming back to that, um, company image I think is really, really important in terms of being taken seriously and also just in terms of getting work. People are much more likely to um, employ you if you're easy to find and easy to understand what it is you're doing and what you're providing. Do you have a specialism? Uh, what is it? Do you have many specialisms? Uh, lots of variety of skills? Make that really clear. Um, and having a message and a style that you stick to across marketing materials just helps bring a bit of adherence um, to your image as a company as well. So that might be, as I say, something like a colour scheme that you stick to or a, a logo, something like that that you get designed. Um, and just making sure that that's all sort of like highly visible and highly identifiable it really helps people just sort of who you maybe don't know, think, oh, well, they look like quite a good person to employ. I'll pursue that a bit further. And making it easy to find out how to contact you and what you can do for clients, that's really important. If you're looking to employ someone for a job, you don't want to have to wade through screens and screens of information. You want to be able to see at a glance, is this probably the right sort of person to contact and ask for further information? Um, something else I was discussing in the break was just in terms of my experience of freelance, how much I have to look for work or how much work comes to me. And I'd say that when you start off, there's an element of getting out there and starting to market your image, getting your name known. Um, as that happens, you tend to build up momentum. You get more and more recommendations um, from people you've worked for who will come back to you and say, oh, well, I know someone else who's looking for someone who can do <coughs> or someone else who can do community group work. Um, so it might start off a bit slow, but the more you do and the more you have a, a sort of an easy sort of identifiable image, the, the, the more people might come to you with work and then that saves on your development time as well. So the marketing and the company image all come back into getting work in the first place. Um, your professional face can take a number of different routes, or all of these in fact. Uh, you might have a website, uh, business cards which you can give out at conferences or if you meet someone, um, social media, whether you're on Facebook, Twitter or a variety of other social media. Having a logo is quite handy if it's something you want to put a bit of time and thought into um, because it, again it's just that sort of immediately identifiable image. And then workwear with a logo, what I find sometimes on site is that you're wandering about behind this vest and there's lots of other contractors there and no one really knows who you are. And so again just 
it's maybe not an essential thing to begin with, but it's useful if you're sort of starting to get a bit of profit, then maybe have a think about getting some high risk vest with your logo on, um, and then people kind of immediately identify you on site as well. Um, this is sort of a couple of screenshots from my website, just to give you a couple, uh, kind of example of what I'm talking about. This is the welcome page, not much information at all, just the very basics in terms of someone figuring out who I am and the fact that I'm doing archaeology and it's across Scotland. That's the kind of message that I wanted to get across there. And it's perhaps even due a bit of an update just to kind of refine it a little bit more. <coughs> On this welcome page, you can then go off to other uh, different parts of the website. Set a project portfolio detailing projects past and present so that people can have a look and see what I've done in the past just to get an idea of whether I've got experience in what they're interested in employing me for. Um, and also, if it's someone you have worked for before, it's nice for them to see their image um, and their company being advertised as well. So every project in this um, has a little bit of information about who I've worked for, who I've worked with, and again, it just helps those links um, continue. So you're doing a bit of advertising for the people you've worked for, they're more likely to come back to you in the future. And then I have a variety of different pages going into a little bit more detail on all the different uh, things that I do. So this is a community and training one, just for an example. There's one for survey, one for excavation, one for commercial work. Um, but just, again, a kind of little bit of information and um, a list of things that can be provided. So if someone's in there just looking at five or six different people and they want to know if you can do aerial photography transcriptions, it's quite quick for them to actually be able to find that information. They don't have to spend too much time. Um, the same way that you try and keep your CV quite short, keep this short and snappy and it just makes it much more accessible for people looking at it. And lots of nice images on this one. Um, I also have business cards as well, and I, again, the same theme. Um, it's something that just, you can hand it to someone that's much more professional than having to scribble down your email on a bit of paper and hand it over. Um, so, marketing strategy. Um, my marketing strategy was non-existent at the start of work because I was just taking on the odd little bit of work here and there from people I knew who offered it to me. But as um, you start to rely on the freelance work a bit more, you need to have to think about how you get your name out there. Um, you can advertise online, uh, you can go to conferences or just send leaflets to conferences if you can't go yourself. Um, if there's like an information pack, people can have your business card in it, something like that. And that's the kind of investment of time and a bit of money that can pay off in the long run. It means if you're having quite a quiet period where people aren't coming to you with work, you can maybe start to cut down <coughs> the time where you're sort of in development, as it were, and by getting lots of clients aware of who you are and uh, what you can do. And just having easy contact details is really important. Have a, like, a separate email for work and make sure you check it and you get back to them as quickly as possible. And it's also useful to have a phone number if you're willing to put your phone number out there or even have a separate sort of cheap phone just to have as a work phone so that people can just contact you and call you up. But it means if you have a work phone, you have the option to turn off in the evening once you're done work. So um, that's where I find investment. Having a portfolio is really important, I think. Even if you haven't got something like a website um, to put it onto, it's important to know what sorts of work you've done in the past and what you, um, you're capable of. And that's the sort of information you'll often see on a CV, but it's quite rare for short-term projects that people would ask me for a CV. They kind of just want an idea of what I've done and then they'll maybe have a chat over the phone. It could be quite informal. If it's something like a longer term project, then you might have to go through a more formal application process with a CV and a portfolio of work. But even if you've got a website to put it on, just keep track of what you've done and when you've done it and the sorts of information that you needed at the time. And that just means you can kind of like keep that record there for putting on a website in the future or just for updating your CV and informing clients of what you've done in the past. So a summary of the major costs to consider. Obviously, again, it will vary depending on what you're wanting to do and what amount of time you're putting into it. Insurance is the biggest concern, I'd say, if you're going to be doing events. For me, for the whole year, doing lots and lots of different things, it's three to five hundred pounds, depending on what sort of pa package you're looking at. Um, so if you're just doing a couple of events, it would be much lower than that. Um, but it could be potentially quite a significant startup cost if you're going full time. Uh, marketing, I've got about 100 business cards for 30 quid and um, you can design them yourself on the website, there's lots of them out there and you, you actually get quite a lot of offers for free business cards if you buy products from sites. Um, so it's worth doing a bit of searching around on the internet for just to get a good deal on. 
Um, but that's maybe the first thing you want to have, is just a business card that's catchy with the logo and email and some contact details. That's a good first investment, I would say. Uh, website, could be a do-it-yourself one, or you might decide to pay someone if you're less into uh, website stuff. What I would recommend as a, as a site to look at would be Weebly, um, which is W-E-E-B-L-Y, and it has templates that are already made, which you can take for free, and then just drag and drop things onto. So you can drag a text box and fill in the text, drag pictures, drag different buttons to click to go to different places. It's very uh, interactive and very easy to learn to use, and there's actually support with it as well. And it's, um, it's open source, so you can actually go into the coding and you can change the coding if you're so minded. Um, and you can change the templates to you. And you can do that on a free one, or you can pay money for a slightly maybe more professional looking one, or a slightly more complex designed one. It's still open source, even though you pay for the template, so you can still then go in and adapt the coding if that's something you want to do. But even if you have no computer skills whatsoever, it's quite straightforward to learn how to use and to, to adapt, and it just gives that um, a sort of like place for people to send people to to look and see what you've done. And it can be a very straightforward website with like a, a welcome page, a list of projects that you've worked on, and like a list of skills that you have, and then your contact details. It doesn't need to be elaborate. Again, maybe better to start off small and then develop as you go on. Um, if you're paying someone to develop a website for you, that's probably at least a couple of hundred pounds, depending on what people are charging and how long they're going to have to take. If it's a couple of days worth of their time, you might be talking about five, six hundred quid. Um, so it's probably worth looking into doing it yourself to begin with. Um, another way you can do it is to go on something like WordPress, which is a blogging site. And WordPress has quite a lot of flexibility in it in terms of being able to make different pages as well as having a blog. Um, what I find is that I'm on social media a little bit, but not a huge amount. I don't have a Facebook page for work, and I don't have a Twitter account. And that's partly because my website so far has done the job for me, and it's something I might go into in the future. But Facebook could be a very good option if you don't want to look into making a full website. You just want to create a Facebook page and network with people through that. And it's particularly relevant for community work as well. Um, advertising. You might want to think about advertising in journals or magazines or at conferences. A couple hundred pounds, perhaps minimum, for that sort of thing. Adverts in journals can be quite expensive, or magazines can be quite expensive. So again, this might be something you do later, depending on how much you need to advertise to get work in. And equipment, it just depends what you need, how much money you need to set aside for that. So that's the kind of major cost to consider. I'd say insurance being a real big one, and business cards just being a kind of a very essential sort. <coughs> Um, these are the useful resources I've been talking about so far. Um, what I would recommend particularly is this website here. It's for this small business advice, startups.co.uk. Um, what I've often found is you go to the, the HMRC website, find the information about becoming self-employed, understand it a bit, and then go to this website and they explain it in normal English and it all makes sense. Um, there's also a forum on this website where people can ask questions and the people coming back um, are fairly knowledgeable and fairly quick to respond. So it's, it's a good resource to have if you've got any technical questions. And for the um, child tax credits, that would be a good place to look as well, I think, for that. Um, RFA, CBA, um, Badger as well should be up here, I should have mentioned that. All these kind of national organisations that um, sort of have information on jobs and have information on working conditions are also very useful to take a look at before starting to think about going into business. Um, that's my website there, um, which is just a bit of shameless advertising. Um, and then the other thing that I maybe draw your attention to is HMRC courses. Um, they do run courses in how to do your own self-assessment and how to do um, other various things. So again, this would be more information if the stuff I've talked to you through on self-employment or self-assessment um, is something you want to go and find a bit more about, these courses can be quite useful. They are sometimes quite dense, but it's a good starting point to at least um, find out. And the way you find out where they're being run is to go to this website, and they do run them in most local authorities every couple of months, um, depending on how many people have booked in. So you probably find one quite close to home that you can go along to and get some advice. 
And so now what we're going to do, if you want to look in your packs, just check that you've been paying attention, although I'm not actually going to mark them. Uh, there's a quiz, uh, so if you want to go through and answer the questions, feel free to confer amongst yourselves. And then at the end, maybe that'll help if there's things that aren't clear or you've forgotten, I can maybe go back over and answer any more questions you have. Um, and we'll see how that goes. Cool.